The trees swayed, creaking in the cold breath of autumn. The three of us marched through scattered leaves, hiking deeper into the inky darkness of Charmouth Wood, just like when we were kids. Hard to believe it's Halloween, Eli muttered, pulling his jacket tighter around him. It's freezing out. Jacob laughed, his voice <laughs> low and booming. This? This is nothing. Come visit me in Alaska sometime, and I'll take you ice fishing. Now that's real cold. Years had passed, but Eli and Jacob were the same as ever, always bickering, always arguing. I walked ahead of them, leading them into the heart of the woods. A small cooler was swinging in my grip. It felt heavy, almost too heavy. But I made a promise to a friend that I'd see this through. Takes you back, doesn't it? Eli said, gesturing to the crowds of children we passed. They were dressed up for Halloween as skeletons and ghosts. They were ferried by smiling parents, each holding a jack-o'-lantern filled with flickering candles, as per Charmouth tradition. Careful, a young boy called to us. The maestro's out tonight. Thanks, buddy, Jacob replied with a thumbs up. Then he lowered his voice so only Eli and I could hear and said, we're counting on it. We crested a ridge and found a creek. Water tricked lazily over scattershot stones. A makeshift log bridge led across it. Children passed the bridge single file. They paid us more warnings and cautioned us that they'd heard the maestro's song out there in the woods. And if we weren't careful, we'd wander far enough to hear it too. Nice to see Charmouth's local boogeyman is still alive and well, Eli remarked. Charmouth's a small town, I told him. Tradition means a lot in a place like this. Eli shrugged. I suppose you're right. The forest became a quieter, lonelier place past the bridge. The sound of laughter faded. Families ceased to cross our path. It had become too late, too dark for hiking. We continued our journey in relative silence, a consequence of spending so long apart. We hadn't spoken since high school, the only thing the three of us had in common anymore was our shared interest in getting tonight over with. And that was a subject none of us wanted to discuss. Jacob paused. Hear that? He said. I paused and listened. Music, harsh and grating, coming from up ahead. It spilled from a speaker atop a red gold hill, one framed by dancing shadows. The shadows flickered vanishing and reappearing like ghosts in a strobe light. Their voices sang, their lyrics were slurred, and as we passed them, the smell of liquor hung heavy in the air. Not sure they're old enough to be drinking, Eli muttered with a frown. Jacob cracked a smile. Oh, lighten up, Eli. It's called being a teenager. Remember when we were young? Back before you solemnly vowed to never have fun again? Oh, very funny, Eli replied. I seem to recall it was next to impossible to have fun chasing you three around. How many houses did we break into again? He shook his head, chuckling softly. Honestly, it's a miracle we never got thrown into juvie. I did my best to smile. I did my best to push the sadness down. To be fair, those houses were long abandoned. Also haunted, Jacob added brightly. Er, allegedly. You know, according to Ryan. The name was like a spell. Silence smothered us, killing our conversation before it had ever had a chance to breathe. Ryan, why did he have to bring up Ryan? We walked the next mile without a word. My arm felt numb and my fingers were cold and brittle as they clutched the handle of the cooler. I tried not to think about the contents. It was filled with so much, so much more than the tiny container would ever lead you to believe. It held memories and regrets. It held should have but did nots and other things much darker still. How far? Eli asked. I glanced down at my phone, happy for the distraction. This deep in Charmouth Woods, I didn't have a hope for a signal, but I'd downloaded some maps beforehand. Topography. They showed the layout of the forest, the creek that ran through it, and all the hills and ridges along the way. Not much further, <clears throat> I told him, clearing my throat. Colton Vale's about 20 minutes away if we keep this pace, maybe sooner. Eli nodded, satisfied. 
Galton Vale, he said. Been a while since I've heard that name. How long has it been? We must have been 14 the last time we were out that far. 15, Jacob corrected. That was the last time we tried the ritual. Ryan was devastated when it didn't work. Ryan, there it was, that name again. My fist tightened around the cooler's handle. Memories played in my head, and I went to work beating them back down. We didn't do the ritual properly, I argued. We didn't have the right ingredients last time. Who knows? Maybe things will be different tonight. A cold breeze swept by. Eli shivered. Honestly, I hope not. More silence, more empty pockets of dead air, of endless quiet interrupted only by the crunch of dead leaves beneath our feet. 20 years, that's how long it had been. As kids, Ryan had brought us here. The four of us became fast friends after joining his paranormal club all the way back in middle school. At night, we'd raid haunted houses and stake out graveyards. By day, we'd interview people who claimed to have been bitten by vampires or been attacked by Bigfoot or summoned Bloody Mary. It was all good fun, at least for Eli, Jacob, and myself. But Ryan? Ryan believed it. All of it. It's why he stayed behind while the rest of us fled for brighter horizons. He claimed there were secrets in Charmouth. He said there was a mystery in town, something buried that he couldn't leave without unearthing. If I find a solid lead, he said to me the last time I saw him, will you come back and help me investigate, Tommy? Sure, Ryan, I lied to him. Of course I will. Jacob took a deep, haggard breath. It pulled me out of my memories and back into the dark forest. All right, he said. I can't keep quiet about this anymore, any of it. Am I insane for thinking this is, well, insane? Eli heaved a sigh. No, I get it. I know what you mean. Something bubbled inside of me. Maybe it was Ryan's memory, or my guilt over lying to him, or the fact that we'd already come all this way and turning back now felt like giving up. It's not up to us, I told him flatly. Ryan wanted this, and as his friends, it's our job to see it through. Really, it's the least we can do. The two of them fell silent. I knew they were having reservations, and it wasn't like I wasn't having them myself. But we'd made a promise. I'd made a promise. Did any of you refresh yourself on the maestro legend? I asked, hoping to change the subject. Not me, Eli said with a shake of his head. Was drowning under client paperwork the past few weeks. Sorry, Tommy. Jacob looked at his feet face awash with guilt. I, uh, I was busy too. Sorry, man. I smiled, happy for the opportunity to fill the quiet. No worries, I told them. I had to look over Ryan's notes before I left. You guys want a quick refresher? Better start from the top, Jacob said with a sheepish grin. It's been ages for me. Same here, Eli added. I forced a <laughs> laugh, anything to lighten the mood. Anything to distract from the thing rolling around inside my cooler. All right, I said. The story goes like this. The maestro lived in Charmouth over a century ago, sometime back in the late 1800s. He was a musician, a violinist. He couldn't find a paying position in a symphony, so he made his living playing on Charmouth's streets. Trouble was, everybody hated his music. One night, a gang of kids tried robbing the maestro. They swarmed him while he was sleeping under a bridge, and when he tried putting up a fight, they beat him with his own violin. They shattered it across his fingers, breaking them badly. Then, as he tried to crawl away, one of the kids used the violin's bowstring to slit the maestro's throat. Jesus, Jacob shuddered. I forgot how dark this story was. Well, that didn't manage to kill him, I told him, as if it were some consolation. Their cut across his jugular was too shallow, and so he was able to drag himself to help and report their attack to the sheriff. But the sheriff didn't give a rat's ass, did he? Asked Eli. Bingo, I replied. The police, the mayor, practically everybody in Charmouth was happy the maestro's hands were mangled and his violin was destroyed. He couldn't play anymore, which meant they could get some peace and quiet. Without his music, though, the maestro had nothing. 
he was forced to beg on the street instead. Months passed. He became hopeless, desperate, and despondent. And that's when he met the stranger. Ah, I remember that creepy fuck, Jacob muttered. Wasn't he supposed to be the devil? I shrugged. Some say so. He told the maestro he could restore his hands, that he could give him the ability to play the violin again, and this time, make music more moving than any who had come before him. Mozart, Beethoven, whoever. All the maestro had to do was listen to the music of his soul on All Hallows' Eve, to indulge in his emotions, to act on his compulsions, and this gift would be his. The maestro, desperate to play again, accepted the stranger's offer. Days later, on Halloween night, the maestro sat quietly and listened to the music of his soul. He fell into himself. He lay on the street, writhing in an emotional cesspool of shame, regret, sorrow, and anger. His thoughts swam with the scorn of those who mocked him, the police who dismissed him, the children who attacked him, left him for dead, and robbed him of the one source of joy his hollow life held. His eyes snapped open. Like a possessed man, he rose and stalked down the cobblestone street toward the alley he knew the children often played dice. He confronted them there, demanded an apology for the pain they'd caused him. But they laughed at him and spat on him. They called him a cripple, a beggar. One lunged at him, knife in hand, intending to finish the job he'd failed. The blade slid into the maestro's stomach. The children cheered. More knives appeared, and more cold steel sank into the maestro's flesh as they surrounded him in a frenzy. Eli shook his head. Little bastards. I ducked under a low-hanging branch. Well, you'll be happy to know it didn't end well for them. The maestro snapped. He grabbed one of the knives, tore it from the child's grip, then ripped it across his attacker's throat. Then another. His last thread of sanity fell away, and he ran down the children like dogs, carrying out his revenge until the gutters ran red. When he finished, he stood panting in the moonlight. Then, just as the stranger had promised, he heard something thrumming inside of him, the music of his soul, his own dark symphony. He let it guide him and consume him. The violin, Eli breathed. That part I do remember. He used the kid's bones to craft a new violin, right? What was it called? Pale, I said, a shiver running through me. He marched through Charmouth on Halloween night, playing his new instrument for all to hear. He drove the town to insanity. Wives smothered husbands, dogs devoured their owners. He marched all the way into Charmouth Woods, finally realizing that the townspeople didn't deserve his talents, not one of them. If anybody wanted to hear the majesty of his music, they'd have to come looking for it and pay a steep price for the privilege. Can't imagine why anybody would, Jacob said sarcastically, the irony of our situation not lost on him. Well told though, Tommy. You're always killer at those old legends. Agreed, Eli said. Thanks, I said meekly. But there's more, right? Eli added. Ryan mentioned it ages ago, the first time we came out to try the ritual. If you managed to find the maestro, managed to listen to his music without losing your mind, then he'd grant you a wish. A wish? Jacob asked. And all you've got to do is listen to some crummy music? You were made for this job, Eli. Eli frowned. What's that supposed to mean? I just mean there's no way the maestro is worse than Nickelback. Oh, fuck off, Eli said, grinning. You know they're catchy. Jacob made a face. If you say so. <laughs> I laughed. For the first time all night, I really, truly laughed. This was the Jacob and Eli I remembered. The goofy, bickering duo that knew just how to get under the other's skin. Despite it all, there was nothing but love between them. Between us, it felt like old times like we were the same gangly kids running around town hunting ghosts, like it was our full-time job. So you've covered the legend, Eli said. But how about the ritual? What's involved in finding the maestro again? <clears throat> I cleared my throat. Well, first of all, it's gotta be Halloween. You know, 
the anniversary of the maestro's first big performance. Done, Jacob said, checking it off with one of his sausage fingers. Next, we've got to find him. He leaves markings on the trees to guide audiences to his show. But you can only see those markings if you use a specific sort of lantern. My next words got caught in my throat. The lantern has to be a... a... I sputtered, unable to finish what I meant to say. A jack-o'-lantern, Eli offered darkly. One made from a human head. I nodded in silence. Jacob cursed. Doesn't get much more depraved than that, does it? No, I admitted. It really doesn't. Even in the darkness, I felt Eli and Jacob's eyes on me. They were staring at the cooler in my grip. The plastic box of nightmares that brought us out here, back to the vast forest. Ryan asked for this, Elin said. It was in his will. We're better off not thinking about it too much and just getting it over with, for old time's sake. Jacob folded his arms, looking uncharacteristically disturbed. Can't believe he asked us to do this. I mean, fuck, man. Who does that? Doesn't matter, I said quickly, sensing the rising resentment in Jacob's tone. We're here. Colton Vale's just across the creek. So let's do what we came here to do and then grab a beer. Who's got the lighter? Jacob fished into his pocket, producing a rusty steel square with letters scratched onto the surface. Our initials. Got it, he said. Candles? I asked, looking to Eli. Eli unslung his backpack, retrieving a bag of tea lights. Will these work? They were the smallest candles I could find. They'll have to, I said. We took turns with the lighter, bringing the flame to our wicks. Eli and Jacob's eyes fell to me and to the cooler. My heart hammered, realizing it was my turn. That it was time for me to do the thing I'd been dreading since I'd first stepped foot in this forest. You all right? Eli asked softly. I'm fine, I said. I took a deep breath, then lowered the cooler and opened the plastic hinges. Trembling, I lifted the lid. An awful reek spilled out from inside, like something dead had swallowed a chemical cocktail. Jacob swept his flashlight toward the cooler. Ryan stared up at me. His decapitated head sat on a bed of ice, his hollowed out eyes gazing lifelessly at the swaying branches above. His mouth hung open, lips pale blue. My stomach churned, nausea flooding me as I did my best not to hurl. Jacob knelt beside me. He spoke quietly, solemnly. Well, that's good at least. Looks like the coroner removed his eyes and tongue. That'll save us the PTSD of cutting them out. I watched him slip his knife back into his pocket. I suppose now we've got to decide who has to carry him. We'll each take a turn, Eli said. It's only fair. No, I croaked. I'll do it. Old memories came up, unbidden and unwelcome. I had promised Ryan I'd return to Charmouth and help him investigate the source of the town's strangeness. I told him that to his face, but then he wrote to tell me he had a lead. When he wrote to ask for the help I'd promised him years ago, I turned him down. You don't have to, Eli began. I know, I said. It's what I want. It wasn't much in the way of penance, but it was the best I could offer. I reached down and tried to grab my friend's head, to lift it out of the cooler, but the skin on his cheeks slipped through my fingers. It was already rotting away. He uses his hair, Jacob suggested, voice hoarse. It'll be easier. My fingers closed around Ryan's hair. I lifted him up from the cooler, his skull spinning limply in my grip. His flesh looked nearly translucent in the flashlight gleam. Uh, all right, I sputtered, wrestling my emotions into submission. Now we place our candles inside. Eli stepped forward, slipping his tea light into Ryan's left eye socket. Jacob took his right. That left the mouth for me. Now kill the flashlights, I instructed. Ryan's notes are specific. We have to navigate by lantern alone. They both turned off their flashlights. The three of us stood there a moment, drowning in darkness, our friend's head swaying in my grip. Ryan's candlelight eyes cast the forest in an ethereal Halloween glow. Let's head out, I said. We moved slowly and carefully, 
using the trees and boulders to steady us as we walked deeper into the gloom. None of us spoke. I suppose it didn't feel right to be chatting just then, to be swapping jokes while candles burned in the skull of Ryan's head. I checked my watch. 30 minutes. That's what we'd agreed upon. We'd wander Colton Vale for 30 minutes. We'd follow the steps Ryan outlined in his notes. And after that, we could sleep a little easier knowing we'd paid our respects. Our deed complete. A promise fulfilled. We'd bury Ryan's head, then we'd head back to our cars and do our best to forget we'd ever done something so morbid to somebody so wonderful. 10 minutes into our wandering, Jacob suddenly halted. He waved us over. Tommy, Eli, check this out. I think there's something carved into the tree. We drifted over. The three of us looked at the bark, eyes squinting to see in the faint candlelight. It's here, Jacob said, running his fingers along a recess in the wood. Do you see it? I looked more closely. Yes, there was certainly something there. A shape, a sort of sigil or rune. It was a narrow gash, a straight line carved into the bark, marked down the middle by a series of sideway seas. Almost looks like a rib cage, I muttered, goosebumps tracing my skin. Eli scratched at it with a fingernail. Probably left by some teenagers, he concluded with a frown. Kids and Halloween pranks. Name a more iconic duo. If it's kids playing a prank, Jacob said, gesturing ahead of us. And they did a pretty thorough job. I lifted Ryan's jack-o'-lantern head. His candle glow spilled across the trees before us and I saw in each of them that same rune, that same sigil. What the fuck, I said. They're everywhere. Wonder where they lead, Jacob asked. Suppose we should find out, I muttered. It's what we came here for, right? Eli shivered, pulling his jacket tighter around him. Yeah, just remember that we all agreed on 30 minutes. It's getting colder by the minute. We trudged off, our boots sweeping through blankets of autumn leaves. The sigils led us. They seemed to go on forever, a never-ending line of rib cages goading us deeper into the heart of Charmouth Woods. The forest seemed to close in on us. The trees narrowed into tight clutches, their branches reaching down and scraping against our heads as we twisted and turned through their maze-like trunks. Then, a sound met my ears. A shrill whine. It came from somewhere distant, somewhere far off in that endless mire of shadows. You guys hear that? Jacob asked. I did, I told him. It sounded terrible, Jacob muttered. Like a razor blade being pulled across violin strings. You guys don't think it's actually him, do you? For the first time, Jacob didn't end his words with a smirk or a chuckle. He was being serious. The maestro? Eli asked in disbelief. Come on, man. It's probably just teenagers screwing with us. My guess is they've got a speaker set up and a few night vision cameras recording their little prank so they can become internet famous. Jacob shook his head, his voice cold with dread. I don't know, Eli. It sounds awful, terrible. It's like, it's like a rat crawled inside my head and started chewing on my eardrums. It's gotta be the maestro. Then he turned and burst out laughing. Well, either that or Nickelback. Eli punched him playfully on the arm. Dude, you actually got me. The two of them stood there, laughing and reigniting their argument over whether or not Nickelback is good music. Normally, it would have been hilarious, entertaining. Normally, it would have been a nice bit of levity after a moment so taut with tension. But as I stood there with Ryan's head in my grip, I couldn't help but notice something that made my blood go cold. The music was getting closer. Silver Side Up is objectively a good album. Eli said defiantly to Jacob. I mean, have you even heard how you remind me? The song went quadruple platinum. You think shitty songs go quadruple platinum? They literally do all the time, Jacob exclaimed. Eli put an arm over my shoulder. Back me up on this, will you, Tommy? You're a guitarist. You know good music. Tell him. I, uh... I couldn't speak. I couldn't think of words to say because my focus was now entirely on the sound in the dark that low whine, that graveyard tune. It was getting nearer now, accompanied by the groan of shifting trees, of snapping branches and the almost imperceptible rumble of something heavy 
moving across the earth. Guys, I said, feeling dazed. Guys, I think... Look, Eli, Jacob said, cutting me off. Just because something's popular doesn't mean it's good. Take the fucking maestro. The guy massacred a whole group of kids, and what happens to him? He's a local celebrity. Half of Charmouth came out tonight with their silly little lanterns to get a glimpse of him. Eli shook his head, incredulous. You're seriously doing this, aren't you? Comparing Nickelback to the maestro? I'm only... A crack of timber pierced the night. Then, a whistle. The three of us turned, and somewhere beyond our vision came the thunderclap of something heavy crashing to earth. We stared silently into the dark. Was that a tree falling just now? Jacob whispered. Eli shook his head, huffing. Great. Now we've got kids chopping down trees as a prank. He stormed forward. I swear, if there's a bunch of little shits messing with us, then I'm going to maestro their asses myself. Jacob <laughs> laughed. I didn't make a sound. Eli flicked on his light, painting the wood in a white glow. Anybody out there? He bellowed. My skin prickled. My breath turned to fog. And I shivered as the temperature seemed to plummet around us. I stumbled backward on instinct, somewhere deep inside of me, somewhere ancient and primal. A panicked chorus of alarm bells began ringing. Listen up, assholes! Eli shouted into the forest, his flashlight darting this way and that, as if to try and catch skittering teenagers. We're trying to pay respects to a dead friend, got it? So cut the crap. Take your stupid prank video, your dog shit music, and go fuck yourself. Eli's voice vanished, stolen by the night. His flashlight fell, rolling through the dirt as its beam casted dancing shadows on the surrounding trees. Eli? I called, uneasy. A sputter met my ears, then a gurgle. It was the sound of words choking in the throat of a man, a sound that made my blood go cold. Eli! Jacob bellowed, scrambling to get his own flashlight out. You better not be fucking with us! He turned it on. Light bathed the forest once more and illuminated the scene in front of us, the man in front of us. My breath caught in my chest. I gasped, staggering forward as my eyes tried to process the scene. It was Eli, except his mouth wasn't working properly. It hung limp. From his lips poured a thick trail of blood. There was something in his chest, a narrow tendril of wood. It pierced his jacket, turning the white fabric a deep crimson. No, I stuttered. No, no, no. Jacob pulled the back of my jacket roughly. Leave it, he said hoarsely. We need to go. We can't leave him, I said weakly, still hardly able to believe what I was seeing. Eli couldn't be dead. People didn't die like that, not in real life. Trees didn't impale people. He's choking, pranking us. He's, he's dead, Jacob said forcefully, shaking me. Then, as if in answer came a loud crack, a flash of a shadow. The tendril of wood that had pierced Eli tore backward, pulling his limp corpse into the shadow of the forest. A voice rose in the back of my mind. Run, it said. We bolted. We ran blindly, Jacob's flashlight bobbing up and down as we cut a path through brush and trees, not caring where we were going so long as it was away from whatever we'd just seen. But then, I think we both knew exactly what we'd seen. After all, we'd lit the candles, followed the sigils, We'd navigated by the light of our dead friend's head, and then we'd even heard the decrepit whine of music, his music, the maestro of Charmouth Wood. Hold on for a second, Jacob said breathlessly, pulling us behind the cover of a massive oak tree. He keeled over, his hands clutched his kneecaps, face red with exhaustion. I knew the feeling. My chest felt like a boiler too, like somebody had lit my lungs on fire. Track the map, Tommy. He panted. Gotta figure out a way out before. Jacob fell backward. His head struck the dirt with a dull thud, and he cursed, pointing his flashlight toward his bottom half. There was something around his ankles, a wooden tendril. Gotta be fucking kidding me, he spat, tossing me his flashlight. Hold this. I'm gonna cut it off. He fished in his pocket, pulled out his knife and got to work. I don't get it, he grunted carving the knife into the wood. Why us? The hell did we do to deserve this? The music, the legend. I swallowed, a thought occurring to me as I tried to help wrestle the wooden tendril from Jacob's legs. 
The maestro took revenge on everybody who insulted his performances. You and Eli. You guys said the sound you heard was awful. I looked up at Jacob, eyes wide with realization. You need to apologize. If you do, he might let us go. Are you listening to yourself? Jacob said, exasperated. If this really is the maestro, then I'll kill him myself. He murdered Eli, Tommy. He fucking... The tendril ripped Jacob backward, sending him into the black forest. I listened as Jacob's body skipped across the forest floor, each impact bringing another empty wheeze. I listened as branches snapped, as bones broke. Then I heard a sharp crack, like a spine splitting itself across the trunk of a tree, and the wheezing stopped. He was gone. He was dead. I reached down, dazed with grief, and picked up Ryan's head. I gazed at it. He was all I had left now. But when I looked into those hollow, candle-gleam eyes, I felt only hatred. Hatred for bringing us here. Hatred for making us suffer through this awful nightmare. Part of me wanted to throw his head into the trees, to get rid of the monster that had led us to our deaths. But another part of me knew that wasn't the truth. The truth was, this was my fault, all of it. A haunting realization fell over me. I'd forgotten part of Ryan's notes. I'd been so convinced he was insane, that his obsession with the paranormal was nothing more than mental illness, that I'd failed to take them seriously. I'd never warned Jacob and Eli against insulting the maestro. I'd completely ignored the whole purpose of Ryan being here tonight. He was more than a jack-o'-lantern to light our way. He was our admission fee. The forest swayed with the sound of parting branches, of falling leaves. Long creeks spilled from the trees, cold groans. It sounded like old limbs shifting with the antique slowness of an ancient horror. He was coming. The maestro marched toward me, and that left me with only one option. I lifted Ryan's head. I held it high above me. I offered it to the dark abyss that swarmed around me, and I said, Maestro, a token to hear you play. A heartbeat of silence. A heartbeat that felt like an eternity, that encompassed whole lifetimes. My knees shook. Piss dribbled down my legs while my teeth chattered like a 1950s pickup truck. I figured I was probably going to die here, and I prayed the maestro would make it quick. Two lights appeared above me. They began as small slits before widening into bright moons, round and full. They hovered near the treetops before falling to the ground, as if they were observing me, studying me. A long groan of wood, another shift of ancient limbs, and I knew then that it was him, the maestro of Charmouth Wood. Those orbs weren't moons, but the monster's eyes and in their blinding glow, I saw now that they sat atop a gnarled head, wearing a crown of crooked branches. Something reached toward me, a hand, one long and twisting, with fingers like narrow sticks. For a moment, I thought it might grab me, that it might break me in its grip, but instead, it plucked Ryan's head from my grip and took it toward those bright eyes. The monster grumbled. It opened a dark maw, dropping Ryan's head into its mouth. A wet pop, a sickly crunch. The maestro chewed on Ryan's head, blood and brain matter leaking out of the creature's wooden teeth. My stomach squirmed, vomit rising in my throat, but I swallowed it back down. I couldn't risk insulting the beast, not after what I'd seen of its temper. The monster finished its meal, humming in satisfaction. It shifted again, rising, Leaves rustled in the dark, and from their direction came a slithering wooden tendril. It held something, somebody. I brought a hand to my mouth, stifling a whimper as I recognized the shape as Eli. I watched in horrified helplessness as the maestro lifted a sharp finger, jabbing it through Eli's chest. The creature calmly broke open his ribs. It fished around his insides, spilling his guts like human confetti lungs, intestines, they all rained from Eli's corpse, striking the forest floor with nauseating wet slaps. I screwed my eyes shut. I couldn't look, couldn't bear to see the maestro's morbid work. Ryan's notes echoed in my mind, and I knew there was only one thing he could be doing, exactly what he'd done a century ago, on a Halloween night just like this. 
He was creating something. I listened to the squelch of discarded organs, the crack of errant bones. I listened as the maestro harvested pieces of Eli for his newest project, an instrument crafted for my ears alone. Welcome. The maestro boomed. His voice echoed like a haunted maelstrom, ethereal and endless. It shook the forest. Birds squawked, scattering from their nests in a flurry of wing beats. My bones rattled in my skin. Thank you, I sputtered weakly. I'm honored to be here tonight. The fiend grunted, kneeling before me upon legs the size of lampposts before presenting its newest creation, a violin. According to the legends, it was called Pale. This instrument was anything but. It was a deep red color, gleaming in the moonlight glow of the maestro's eyes. And all across it were scraps of Eli's flesh and patches of his hair. I grimaced, recognizing his ribcage in the body of the instrument. His tendons, still wet with blood, were pulled tight across to use as its strings. We begin, said the maestro. He lifted the bow, something made out of Eli's femur, and brought it to the face of the violin. Then his symphony began. The first note stole my breath. It forced me to my knees, gasping as my mind became awash in a tsunami of delirium. Madness filled me. It crept in through my ears, swam around the inside of my skull, then poured itself through my veins like molten fear. And I wasn't alone. The forest erupted with a cacophony of shrieks, of agonized bleeding. Birds darted from overhead, spiraling through the air in twos and threes. They snapped and pecked at one another. Deer cut across my vision in a stampede of antlers. They charged, even as smaller animals like chipmunks and squirrels skittered up their legs and ripped into their raw venison. Charmouth Woods had descended into unbridled chaos, into insanity. The maestro's twisted tune had infected even the trees, which began to sag and wither, decaying as they drowned in his dark melody. And I wanted to join them, all of them. I wanted to indulge in the carnage, to help paint the forest in blood, to be a part of this beautiful moment in a way that only violence could allow. My fingers twitched and ached. My tongue slipped across my lips as I imagined the ecstasy of bashing my skull against a tree, or finding a long stick, something rough and splintered, and slowly running it through my eyes. Ash, a voice said. That would be a lovely offering, wouldn't it? Another voice entered my mind, this one gentle, familiar. No, it told me. If you die now, then Jacob and Eli will have died for nothing. They'll be trapped lost in suffering for all of eternity. Remember my notes, remember my will. Ryan, his voice echoed in my skull and I collapsed to the dirt with the groan. My mind spun. It rioted in a typhoon of tragedy, of grief. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. He was the reason I'd come here tonight. But why? What was it he had said? This was about more than simply paying our respects even if I hadn't believed it at the time. Darkness, he'd mentioned a darkness, something that permeated Charmouth, and perhaps as long as two centuries ago. Ryan said that darkness owned us, that it laid claim to the soul of every person born in our town, Eli, Jacob, and myself included. There was only one way to save a soul from that darkness, and according to Ryan's notes, it stood before me, the maestro's wish. I screamed. I threw back my head, roaring in a guttural, defiant desperation. If I was going to survive the maestro's music, then I had to drown it out somehow, avoid it. I didn't know how long I spent screaming. All I knew was that by the time I'd finished, my throat was sore and I was coughing blood. The music, however, had ended. I'd survived the maestro's symphony. I groaned, my muscles stiff and cramped. It felt like I'd dislocated my shoulder while writhing in the dirt, and I figure I probably had. My head pounded, my mind ached. It took me moments to collect myself, moments that became minutes, and the maestro seemed patient enough to wait. Eventually, 
I found the strength to stumble onto my hands and knees. And when I lifted my head, I saw a graveyard where the forest should have been. Animals, their carcasses were everywhere. Dead songbirds littered the dirt. Insects already fast at work, burrowing into their flesh. A pair of deer lay in front of me, one having gored the other while it was consumed by still feeding squirrels. Ovation? Asked the maestro. My heart raced. I turned to the monster itself, the crooked beast that sat perched atop the hillside, its full moon eyes hovering in the dark. It looked like a bundle of sticks, some decrepit titan, older than hate and fashioned from wicker and lost dreams. My arms were sore, my palms bloody, but I brought them together all the same. I clapped. The maestro hummed, its scarecrow frame creaking forward in apparent satisfaction. Wish. It rumbled. I swallowed. The wish. It was time for me to do what I'd come here to do. The very thing I dismissed as lunacy. I was going to make a wish to a monster that didn't exist, couldn't exist. A wave of regret passed through me, cold and heavy. Damn it. Ryan had told me, warned me that there was evil in Charmouth. Our spirits never died. Our souls didn't belong to us but to an elder god who fed them into an eldritch machine to use as fuel. An elder god that walked among us to this day. A stranger, the very same that once gifted the maestro his dark power. My jaw tightened, my hands balling into fists of frustration. Ryan knew he was going to die, he must have. I figured that's why he wrote his will the way he had, why he'd entrusted it to me why he'd begged me to use his head to complete this morbid ritual. He realized the stranger was onto him, that it had caught wind of Ryan's efforts to flee our town from its clutches. Wish? The maestro repeated. The monster's voice had fallen, coated now with the venom of a threat. It was growing impatient. Apologies, I said quickly, doing my best to bury my fear. M my, my wish is to free the souls of Charmouth, past and present. I w wish for you to release them from the stranger's hold. The maestro blinked. Impossible. No, that couldn't be. What do you mean? I asked, my indignation strangling my fear. I'd done exactly as Ryan had asked, even phrasing the wish just as he'd described. Beyond my power, rumbled the maestro. Three souls I offer, no more. My heart fell. After so much pain, so much sacrifice, three souls felt like a pittance. That still left thousands in the grip of the stranger, their souls lost to his appetite. My nails gripped the dirt. I dragged them across it, snarling in defeat. I hated this. I hated this all the more because it made sense. The maestro had been granted its power by the stranger, so of course it couldn't overthrow him. A compromise was the best the creature could offer me. Damn. All right, I said hoarsely. Got it. In that case, I wish for the souls of Eli Acosta, Jacob Young, and Ryan Colthart to be released from the stranger's hold. Free them. The maestro's eyes shone, glowing brighter and brighter. They pulsed. The ground trembled beneath my feet, the wind whipping about in a helming scream as lightning poured from the sky like falling rain. Bolts struck in a flurry of ash and cinder, felling trees in a wide circle around us. Then, in a vacuum of air, it all vanished. The lightning, the animal corpses, everything. It is done, the maestro declared. Then, it turned for me, its long limbs creaking as it stalked back toward the trees, back into the abyss it had come from. I watched it go, feeling numb with loss. My chest heaved. I fell backward onto a blanket of leaves, and I choked back tears until I couldn't choke them back any longer. Then I cried. I cried until the sun bled over the horizon, until the night had been burned away by the day. And then I kept crying because there was nothing else for me to do. I'd failed. I'd failed Charmouth, and I'd failed myself. The hike back was long, haunting. I spent it lost in my thoughts, absorbed in grief and regret. Three souls, that was all the maestro could offer me. 
and that meant so many were still on the hook, myself included. Sooner or later, I'd die. When that happened, I wouldn't get to pass on like my friends, because I was already spoken for. I'd stolen from an elder god, a monster more terrifying than the maestro could ever hope to be, a creature who subsisted on the souls of the damned. I'd taken three of those souls, robbed it of its fuel, its food. A chill crept through me. I wondered, cold with dread, what horrors the stranger would have in store when we finally crossed paths, when my soul passed into his grasp. Who knows, I said darkly. Maybe he'll give me a new guitar, and the maestro and I can start our own band. I laughed. I laughed all the way back to the car, because laughter was all I had left. There was no escaping my situation, my fate. For Eli and Jacob, the nightmare of the maestro was over. For me, the nightmare of the stranger had just begun, and I had a horrible feeling it wasn't the sort of nightmare I'd ever wake up from. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.